this video, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters. These are the chemical molecules that are released from the synapse of a neuron that move across the synaptic cleft and bind to a target cell. Neurotransmitters can bind to other neurons or muscle cells like skeletal or smooth muscles or glands like your adrenal gland. And where those neurotransmitters bind, what part of the brain or what part of the body, that will determine what kind of an effect they have. When neurotransmitters move across the synapse and bind to a receptor on the target cell, we call that receptor a chemically gated channel or a ligand gated channel. And most of the time, those channels will let ions move into or out of the cell. So with neurotransmitters, when they bind to the target cell, they can excite that cell, an EPSP, or they can inhibit that cell, an IPSP. So excitatory postsynaptic potentials are going to trigger the movement of ions so that inside of the cell becomes more positive and brings it closer to the threshold level for depolarization. Whereas an inhibitory postsynaptic potential will cause a negative charge to either build up inside of the cell or positive charges to leave so that the cell becomes hyperpolarized and further away from the threshold level. Neurotransmitters, most of the time they're made from amino acids, but sometimes they can be peptides, and sometimes they can be proteins, and sometimes they can be other substances like nitric oxide or adenosine. And I'll talk a little bit about adenosine because it's cool. So just to refresh your memory, we have an axon terminal here, and we are showing the synaptic cleft. So in the axon terminal, there was an action potential that came down and changed the charge of the cell. When we depolarize the membrane, we move positive charges in, and that action potential charge change triggers voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium moves in, and neurotransmitters move out. When these neurotransmitters are released, they bind to specific receptors on the target cell. If the target cell becomes more positively charged inside, that is an EPSP, or an excitatory postsynaptic potential. If the cell becomes more negatively charged, that is an IPSP. So the type of neurotransmitter and the type of receptor and the target cell all determine what kind of an effect that neurotransmitter is going to have. So what we're going to do in this video is look at a bunch of different kinds of neurotransmitters and we are going to look at their general characteristics and what kinds of effects they generally cause. Okay, so the first one is acetylcholine. It is made from the choline portion of a phospholipid and the acetyl-CoA that we have talked about before when we oxidize pyruvate in the Krebs cycle. When you put acetyl-CoA and choline together, you have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the primary neurotransmitter that causes muscle contraction. So in our somatic system, we can voluntarily control our skeletal muscles. And when we decide to contract a muscle, that neurotransmitter is always going to be acetylcholine. When acetylcholine binds, it is always excitatory and always causes muscle contraction. Acetylcholine is also important for thinking. We use it in our brain for cognitive functions. So thinking, learning, and memory. It's a very important role of acetylcholine. And people that have Alzheimer's have reduced acetylcholine, making thinking, learning, and memory much more difficult. There are other aspects to that, but generally in people with Alzheimer's, they decrease the number of neurons that produce acetylcholine. Dopamine is one of my favorites because it's involved in motivational behavior and focusing your attention. When you're trying to study and you can't and you're distracted and your brain is all over the place and you try to focus and you're just not absorbing the information, that's because your dopamine is low. So we need a certain amount of stress, not tons of it, but just enough to give us enough dopamine to be motivated to do things. So dopamine is very important for paying attention, focusing, concentrating, and getting a task done. Dopamine is also really important in the reward behaviors. So anything that is addictive, dopamine is playing a role in that. 
And then dopamine actually also has another role in your midbrain part of your brain at the top of your brainstem. Dopamine will inhibit motor neurons, and this is important for controlling motor movements. So without dopamine in the midbrain, then you have uncontrolled muscle movements, and that actually is what is involved in Parkinson's disease. Endorphins. These are also great because they are like the runner's high molecules. They are painkillers. So they reduce pain and they make us feel good and pleasurable. Think about the next time you go for a run and you feel really good, then that's endorphins. If you don't feel good, then it's something else. And here's a little summary. So next we will talk about two excitatory neurotransmitters that are very important for thinking, learning, and memory. Okay, so glutamate is the first one. Glutamate is probably expressed by 90% of the neurons in your brain. It is the most prevalent excitatory neurotransmitter. And without glutamate, you have very decreased cognitive functions. So we need to have glutamate so that we can think and plan and problem solve and do all of that stuff. But excess amounts of glutamate can cause anxiety because it's very stimulating. Excess glutamate can also be involved in seizures and it can cause excitotoxicity. Way too much glutamate can actually kill neurons. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit again in a few minutes when I talk about some drugs and how drugs impact neurotransmitters. Then we have our stress hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are made by the autonomic nervous system when we have a sympathetic nervous system reaction. And these will cause all of the typical stress response things to happen, like dilating your pupils, increasing your heart rate, dilating bronchial tubes and blood vessels. Next, we have two inhibitory neurotransmitters. One is called GABA, stands for gamma amino butyric acid, and the other one is glycine. Glycine is an amino acid, and GABA is made from an amino acid called glutamine. Actually, glutamate is also made from glutamine. Glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter, and GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter, they should be balanced. If you have too much GABA, you're gonna feel tired, and if you have too much glutamate, you're gonna feel anxiety. So we want those neurotransmitters to be balanced. So GABA and glycine play an important role in making you feel calm. They're your natural anti-anxiety neurotransmitters. Next is serotonin. This is our calm and content neurotransmitter. So serotonin is associated with depression. If you have low serotonin, then you tend to have a higher risk of depression. People often think of serotonin as your happy hormone, but serotonin doesn't actually make you happy, excited, happy. Okay, excited happy is gonna come from dopamine and norepinephrine and some acetylcholine, probably glutamate too, the excitatory ones. But serotonin, the best way that I, I can explain how serotonin feels, think about the last time you had a really delicious dinner, that feeling after you've eaten really good food, where you're just calm and content and relaxed and satisfied and you feel very good. That is serotonin. And we actually make more serotonin in our digestive tract than we do in our brain. The serotonin that we make in our digestive tract impacts our brain and tells us that we feel good and comfortable and content. Serotonin plays an important role in regulating our appetite and our mood. Three more neurotransmitters. One is called adenosine. Do you remember ATP? Adenosine triphosphate, that's our energy molecule. When we use up ATP, then we produce some excess free adenosine. And that can bind to receptors and it makes us feel tired. That's logical, right? You use up energy and then you start to feel tired. And so when adenosine increases, it makes us tired and we fall asleep. Next we have anandamide. Anandamide binds to cannabinoid 
receptors. The same receptors that cannabis, marijuana binds to. And in our body, it's not psychoactive, but it does play a role in reducing inflammation and decreasing pain and increasing pleasurable feelings. And then lastly, histamine. I wanna mention this one because we often think of histamine as our allergy molecule, which is true. You increase the amount of histamine you produce when you have an allergic reaction, but it's also involved in thinking. It is an excitatory neurotransmitter in our brain. And this is why sometimes if you take an antihistamine medication for allergies, that it makes you feel tired. And now I just want to compare some drugs that we know about and what neurotransmitter they impact. Now when drugs have an effect on our brain and our body, they can increase the effect of the neurotransmitter. So they're called an agonist if they increase that effect, or they can block an effect and then they are called an antagonist. So drugs can act by increasing or decreasing the function of neurotransmitters depending on where they bind and how they bind. We will go through a few interesting examples. Nicotine acts on two different receptors primarily, acetylcholine and dopamine. Acetylcholine, remember, is involved in cognitive thinking and learning and memory, and dopamine is involved in motivation and reward. Nicotine is extremely addictive. Drugs like Ritalin or Adderall are amphetamines and they are stimulants and they primarily act on dopamine receptors. And this is used to treat attention deficit disorder. So remember dopamine is the primary neurotransmitter involved in making you focus your attention. Alcohol has a lot of interesting effects. Alcohol impacts multiple neurotransmitters. It increases some and it decreases some. And it has the weird ability to be a stimulant and a depressant. So it increases dopamine, which is reward and pleasure and motivation. And this is where it can make you motivated to do things. Okay, maybe not smart things. Because you also decrease acetylcholine. And we need acetylcholine for thinking and making choices. So that is decreased. We also decrease glutamate. So glutamate, also a thinking molecule. When you decrease glutamate, you decrease anxiety. And this is why alcohol feels relaxing. So you're decreasing the glutamate molecules, but you're also decreasing your thinking abilities. It's dose dependent. So the more alcohol consumed, the more these effects will occur. Another thing that is affected is GABA. GABA is our anti-anxiety neurotransmitter and it makes us feel calm and relaxed. And then it also produces some serotonin, which makes you feel content and maybe more social. Acetylcholine also, remember, plays a role in muscle contraction. And if you decrease acetylcholine in a part of your brain called the cerebellum, it is the part of your brain at the back of your brain that helps you coordinate muscle movements. And alcohol highly targets the cerebellum, which makes you lose your coordination abilities. And then the last thing I wanna mention is the glutamate aspect. Okay, glutamate is excitatory. When you decrease glutamate, you feel calm and relaxed. With alcohol, there's a rebound effect. The next day, the glutamate that was decreased during the alcohol consumption, the next day that will be increased. And so alcohol consumption can actually increase anxiety. Opiates are neurotransmitters that inhibit pain. So these are inhibitory. Some examples would be codeine, morphine, and heroin. They are types of opiates. Opiates are extremely addictive. So they are binding to opiate receptors like our endogenous endorphins. Ephedrine is a drug that affects epinephrine. So epinephrine, remember, is our stress response. Our autonomic nervous system releases epinephrine through the sympathetic pathways. So ephedrine is a stimulant. Sometimes ephedrine is put into 
medications that make you tired. So if you have non-drowsy versions of medications like cold medication or allergy medication, it usually has a little bit of ephedrine in it. Next we have benzodiazepines. These are drugs like Valium, Diazepam, Clonazepam, Lorazepam, Ativan, any of those azepams are benzodiazepines and they impact GABA receptors. Remember that GABA is our anti-anxiety neurotransmitter. So benzodiazepines are used to treat panic attacks and sometimes insomnia, but they can be very addictive. Your brain can adapt to these and stop producing its own GABA and then you become dependent. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs, they are depression medications. They are used to treat depression. When serotonin is released from the neurotransmitter and serotonin goes into the synapse, normally the serotonin is taken back up and then it'll be released again when it's signaled. So a serotonin reuptake inhibitor prevents the reuptake and that means the serotonin stays in the synapse and it can keep acting on the target cell to make you feel less depressed. Because so much serotonin is actually produced by the digestive system, there can be some digestive system side effects in the beginning of taking serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Caffeine. Caffeine keeps us awake because it inhibits adenosine. Remember we talked about how adenosine makes us sleepy. So if caffeine blocks those receptors, then it is going to decrease sleep. Cannabis, or THC, is a psychoactive drug and it binds to our cannabinoid receptors and it increases pleasure and reduces pain. And lastly, hallucinogens. Hallucinogenic drugs like acid or psilocybin, which is mushrooms, they cause distorted perceptions by binding to serotonin receptors. So normally serotonin makes us feel calm and good, but extreme amounts of serotonin causes hallucinations. So there we go. Check out the description below for the downloadable PDF and see if you can match the neurotransmitter to the function and the drug to the neurotransmitter.